Hello and welcome to the first of five sessions about vitality. The five topics will be the flow aspects of vitality, that'll be today, and then sexual, personal, communal, and universal aspects. So concentrating on flow. To get the discussion started, I want to give a little background about the Spiritual Biology Project, and that will lead directly into our topic of vitality. The idea is that we take a little bit of science and a little bit of spirituality, the kind of insights and value structures of wisdom traditions, and we try to find some common ground and some conversation between them. I should say at the outset that on the spiritual side, I'm not what would be considered a expert. Like many of us, I've spent years in spiritual practice. I've read a number of books, etc. But I haven't pursued a degree. I don't work in the field uh, professionally, except uh, in terms of teaching this class. I should also say that when it comes to vitality, I'm not really an expert. I have some chronic medical conditions that leave me fatigued often. And part of my motivation for doing this session is to work on my own vitality. So I'm not trying to present myself as someone who has all the answers, who knows how to maximize vitality at all times. I probably can claim a little more expertise in the uh, area of science and biology because I've had a lot of advanced education in those uh, areas. Still, my approach to it is going to be more artistic and uh, personal. It's not going to emphasize heavily a lot of factual or detailed uh, information. There will be some of that, but not a lot. I'd like to hold out as an inspiration for us uh, this uh, famous scientist Barbara McClintock. She won the Nobel Prize uh, late in life in her 80s for work that she had done decades earlier. During that earlier time frame, she was largely ignored by the mainstream scientific and biological communities, but she did some very impressive work, especially given the technologies available in her day. A book written about her was entitled A Feeling for the Organism, which reflected her approach to biology. And I like that phrase very much. Probably her mindset seeped into the biological culture that uh, instructed me and helped me get to where I am today. And either way, she uh, deserves more recognition than she's received. So I, I said she was famous, and I think among biologists she probably is, but she's certainly not famous uh, in the general public. So let's move on now and begin to focus more specifically on the topic at hand, this question of vitality and how flow plays into it. Well, as I've said, we're going to be bringing both scientific and spiritual perspectives to it. And so by scientific, I clearly mean, you know, the data that comes out of experimentation and objective observation. By spiritual, I mean an emphasis on our interior subjective lives, you know, the direct experience of being alive as opposed to observations about it through uh, instruments and other means. I'd like to bring both of these to bear on the human body, which is, after all, where the two really come most together. The body is the seed of our subjective experience, and it's also the focus of biological study, at least for a lot of it. And in the body, we can begin to notice a kind of interplay between what we know about how it works scientifically and what we can feel in our direct experience, that is to say, spiritually. And as these flow and intermingle and converse with one another, something begins to happen. And that is a sense of aliveness, greater connection with the body, greater respect for what's happening inside, and really more vitality. At least this has been my experience, and I hope it will be yours. Well, if you've been following along in the College of Marine class or watched some of the videos, you know that in the past uh, few months, we've been covering topics like pain, aging, and mortality. These are inherently heavy topics, and although the emphasis has been on finding 
you know, something positive and encouraging in them, there's no doubt that they do tend to weigh us down. And so it's a pleasure now to turn things around a bit and focus on something that's inherently more uplifting, which is to say vitality. And this would be a good place to define the term for our purposes. Obviously, it's got a dictionary definition. But for me, what I'm going to be you know, using it to refer to is the energetic quality, the sense of zest, the you know, feeling that life matters, the sort of thing that gets us up in the morning and keeps us going. And it's also the sort of thing that, you know, kind of keeps us on our toes, keeps us adapting to life, you know, trying to do our best, trying to, you know, maximize our appreciation of life, our ability to help others, and so on. That, to me, is the essence of vitality. To begin to work with it, I want to draw on Chinese medicine. For a couple of years, I practiced acupuncture, so I know a little bit about it. And I think all of us are familiar with the concept of qi, or bodily energy, that comes from Chinese medicine. In my opinion, qi is strongly related to what we call vitality and could be looked at as a kind of generator of it, or a fuel for it. So as you probably know, within Chinese medicine, this qi is believed to flow through energy channels in the human body. Now, right there, some people will be tripped up with skepticism. They'll say, Chi, what are you talking about? You know, that's never been demonstrated by scientific methodology. Well, you know, that, that statement alone is a little debatable because there have been experiments that purport to identify something like Chi or the channels in which it flows. But it's, you know, sort of beyond doubt that at least at the present time, biomedicine has not demonstrated the existence of qi to everyone's satisfaction, and there's a lot of skepticism in the field about it. I want to, you know, sort of sidestep the skepticism rather than address it head on by focusing on the felt aspects of qi. So in my experience, both as a, you know, one-time acupuncturist and as a person that spends a lot of time paying attention to what's available to me in my body, I have found that qi is something that can be experienced by humans, including myself and the patients uh, who received acupuncture from me. That doesn't necessarily mean that it can be measured with an instrument. And I would draw a parallel here between qi and love. We all have felt love, and yet there is no instrument that measures it. We can find correlates of love, like neurotransmitters such as oxytocin. There can be you know, studies of activity in brain regions using functional MR imaging that will you know, sort of show what parts of the brain are active when we feel love. But we can't measure love itself. That's a subjective phenomena and beyond measurement at the present time. So qi, I think, can be looked at similarly to that. If we experience it, then it's real in our experience, regardless of whether it can be objectively verified. So with that as a basis, the idea of qi is that when it's flowing freely and smoothly through the body, there's a sense of harmony and well-being and, we could say, vitality. So the free flow of qi generates our sense of vitality. We might liken it to a water wheel. So the water that flows over a wheel would be like the chi, and it's providing the motive force that leads to the useful output of the wheel, whatever that might be, grinding flour, let's say. So this is going to be a metaphor that I want to elaborate on just a little further. And to do so, we'll take a more modern uh, setup, namely a kind of hydroelectric plant, such as we see here. So there's a dam that creates a container for water, that is a reservoir. And there is a system that allows the water to flow from behind the dam down into the river below. And in the process, it turns a generator. And the generator sends electricity out through the transmission lines. So if we look at this in action, the flow goes down, turns the generator, and out the other side comes the electricity. Now, if we use this as a metaphor, we could say that the water is like the chi, or the chi is like water, and the electricity output is the vitality. And so the flow of the chi generates this vitality, which is what motivates us to move through life with optimism and zest.
it should be clear that for this system to function properly, it needs to have some containment. You know, there needs to be water in the reservoir. That's one requirement. And another is that there needs to be openness in the channels through which the water flows. So containment and openness are key qualities that are essential to the proper functioning, both of a hydroelectric system, but more importantly for our purposes, the generation of vitality in a human body. Now, I, I may be carrying this metaphor a little too far, but the concepts of containment and openness will serve us well. Before we get to them, let's look at what happens if one or the other is absent, if there isn't sufficient containment or there isn't sufficient openness. If the flow is halted, then we end up with a kind of stagnation. This is well understood in Chinese medicine as a source for uh, distress and discomfort. That is, if the flow in a meridian gets blocked, then the qi accumulates and it creates, for instance, ses sensations of pressure and over the long haul may even turn into a tumor or some other illness. So the maintenance of free flow is important and that maintenance of flow depends on these two qualities of containment and openness. And I want to look at them a little further now and from a more biological perspective. Here we see a diagram of the exterior of a cell. And our bodies have trillions of these things in them. And if you've taken a biology class, you learned that the cell is the basic unit of life. So the functioning of a cell is absolutely central to the functioning of life. If we open the cell up and peek inside, we see that there is a lot of structure in it. And these little items that we see all have important functions. And in your biology class, if you took one, you would have learned the names and functions of many of them. They need to be contained. They have to be kept in place or the cell will die. So there's a membrane around the cell that makes sure that what is important to the cell is kept within the cell. It also helps protect the cell from harmful materials that might come in from the outside. So that's the containment aspect. At the same time, the membrane around the cell can't be you know, completely impervious or the cell won't survive. It has to, after all, get water and oxygen and food. And there are materials like uh, waste products and carbon dioxide that have to be expelled. So for the cell to function as a living entity, it has to both contain its interior with a proper environment and remain open to interchange from the outside. That's a scientific take on these two terms of containment and openness. They play a role in the billions of cells that communicate with one another in our brains and lead in large part to our conscious experience along with the rest of the body. Dan Siegel, a neuropsychiatrist who has written a lot about meditation and the brain, describes the brain and the mind as a joint system of energy and information flow. I'm going to change the terminology a little uh, and say that it's a joint system of chi and attentional flow. The idea here being that as we shift our conscious attention around the body, we will also be shifting the movement of chi. And so we can use our minds to influence the movement of chi. And again, I'm talking here about the subjective experience of energy in the body. I'm not making a claim that you know, we would ever be able to measure this en energy with an instrument. Maybe someday we will. Right now, we really can't. We might be able to detect changes in blood flow or something like that. But chi itself is not measurable, and that does not matter for this purpose because it is something that can be felt as a subjective phenomenon, just like love. Well, the idea of flow in a psychological sense has been around for a few decades now. It was introduced by this psychologist, whose name I won't attempt to pronounce, but he made note of how you know, very skilled athletes and creative artists, people that do any kind of skilled movement, and even meditators can get into states of flow where they have a high degree of attention, there's a strong sense of energy and vitality and well-being. 
And this clearly is related to what we want if we want to generate more vitality in our lives. Let's focus now on the mindfulness route to flow because it bears directly on what we just looked at about chi and attention. During mindfulness, we are directing our attention toward the experiences in the body. And by doing so, we are influencing the felt experience of energy or chi in our bodies. And so we can use mindfulness to generate interior flow. And in that way, we will actually generate vitality along the lines of that hydroelectric metaphor that I presented earlier. So now we have brought in the more subjective or spiritual side to add to the scientific dimension that we looked at before. And the containment and openness will play a role here, just as it did when we looked at the human cell. And we can bring both that spiritual sense of noticing how attention changes our feelings of energy and flow in the body to the scientific understanding of the centrality of containment and openness in biological life. And in that way, we will be generating the vitality in our bodies.